I would like to welcome Professor Ben Friedman, who does not need any introduction to in, in, in this circles, also no, in, in other circles. Ben uh, comes from Australia, and he is one of the, the key brains behind the idea of screening in atrial fibrillation. Uh, ben was the first author of the World Heart Federation roadmap uh, for, for atrial fibrillation, so it, he has a global perspective. And we are very grateful to you, Ben, that you are here and that you jump in. It's nice to be able to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I also echo your views about what uh, Faisal has presented. It's really important to hear the patient viewpoint. Um, and I'm really pleased to see, but you have volunteers, for example, in the public, 80% of whom own their own blood pressure device. So that's an interesting group, but maybe not the most representative. And you also have people from an EP clinic who also are very invested in their um, atrial fibrillation and have a bit more information. But I can tell you that in a group of people, older people who've had atrial fibrillation in hospital, discharged in sinus rhythm, this is after non-cardiac surgery, we were able to give them a smartphone with an ECG device and train them to be able to measure it a number of times in their home. And a quarter of them had atrial fibrillation that was silent post-discharge. I really like the Omron, though, because it combines blood pressure and ECG rhythm strip in the one device. This is really essential because, as you said, Gerd, they are very bad bedfellows, high blood pressure and atrial fibrillation. Let me just give you one example. In the, um, in the trial, the loop study that was done in Denmark with volunteers, 4,500 people came. One third had blood pressure at the beginning of the trial that was 160 millimeters of mercury or more, one third. Although the trial was overall negative, the group that benefited was the group that had a blood pressure over 160. And this is a third of the people in the trial. It's not a small subgroup. This is with intensive monitoring. I think that what we are seeing in the intensive monitoring and treatment is looking at one of the parts of the picture because you need to control both blood pressure and you need to do the, the work we need to do on atrial fibrillation. So combining them together, the two most important reversible, preventable causes of stroke makes good sense. And I think that older people can easily be trained to do this work with something that is simple in a combined device. Mm -hmm. So that's my take home message from this. Thanks, Ben. Um, the, the floor is also open for questions or comments from, from the audi auditorium. So uh, if, you, if you have questions uh, to, to the faculty, please uh, go to the microphone and, uh, and uh, we take them. Um, I have a question for, uh, for Faisal. Based on what you have experienced and, and observed in, uh, in your trial, what would be the next reasonable step in, in the field of uh, clinical trials? What would be your idea where to go next? That's a, that's a very, very good question. I, I just echo the comments that have been made by both of you about patients, just coming back to those points. Um, I think in, in our group, we did have quite a few elderly patients. We actually did approach a couple who couldn't take part because they had no smartphones. And this is a fantastic device. The one thing I would say is that if, uh, if some kind of display could be integrated in, so that the patients don't need a smartphone. I think that would be very, very useful. In terms of next stages, Gerhard, to answer your question, you know, we, we are currently looking at a, a study of, of AF patients uh, who undergo ablation. So as, as an EP guy, you know, you, you will know this, the most frustrating things you do in ablation. We know patients have lots of risk factors um, that uh, they ca that's caused the AF, and the AF comes back again, despite, uh, you know, a very good initial AF ablation procedure. Um, and it's often risk, risk factors such as hypertension, other things such as obesity, such, uh, such as lifestyle, alcohol intake, all of these things contribute to that recurrence. 
And one thing that I think would be very useful in a study that we're currently working on um, is potentially to look at patients who are undergoing AF ablation, who have the AF ablation done, and to try and modify the risk afterwards, possibly with these devices. So the education is very, very important. Patients are educated and told, look, it's critical that you maintain good blood pressure control, cut back on your alcohol. Weight loss is a very, very difficult thing to achieve. We know that from the trials. But actually, I think the, the next step would be to see the intervention and the effects of these devices in clinical use. And, and I think certainly the AF ablation group would be a very useful one, I think, to study. Thank you. We have questions from the floor, and we start with you. Please. Hi. Leticia from Brazil. Uh, I would like your opinion about the difference between accuracy and how do you trust blood pressure measures with the arm cuff and the wrist cuff. I tend to find the wrist are not so um, uh, replicable with uh, office blood pressure, yeah. but the patients love their wrist devices. Yeah. So I always advise them to buy the arm cuff one, but I'd like your opinion on that. Thank you. I think in general, um, when we're combining the devices, um, I would go for an arm cuff um, because that's what, particularly in the older age group, this is what people are used to when they go to their general practitioner or if they buy a device, it will almost always be an arm cuff. Um, it's different though, I think, for younger people or for people who are more interested um, and want to do it more continuously, I think there is a place for the wrist cuff. I'm not the best person to tell you about any um, combined studies or comparative studies, but you, it's really choice of the device for the person. And in the group where we're interested um, in looking for things, it's often in the older age group, in which case I would probably go for the wrist. If, it, if you're looking at more continuously, and then, uh, sorry, for, for the uh, arm. And if you're looking more continuously, then the wrist has its advantages. Next question. Yes, sir, please. Abdullah Mohammed from the UK. Um, I have a comment and a, and a question. The comment uh, clearly for preventative medicine, the future sounds great with uh, digital hospitals and uh, telemedicine. Uh, however, now, faced in the clinic with your patients with the uh, smart devices, and knowing the limitations of uh, ambulatory ECG monitor, for example, utility uh, and, and result is really not useful. How would you manage patients' expectations? Because now, when you're in the clinic, you would like to pick up more AF, you'd like to control the blood pressure, but then you, you're, you're a very busy physician with many patients looking after. How do you manage your patients with those expectations? And of course, there are also medical legal implications. For example, if you say to patients, send me downloads from your smartphone on, you know, AF when they have maybe ectopics or artifacts and you're busy in your holiday or doing other things. How, how do you manage these things these days? So, thank you for the question. We take two perspectives. We start with Ben and then we go to Faisal. I think in, in regular care, we have to change the paradigm of how we do it. But when a survey was done of physicians in 20 countries, 50 primary care physicians in how often they took the pulse or checked for atrial fibrillation in the last two weeks in people aged over 65, it was about 15% in the United Kingdom and about 11% in Australia. So even the very most basic office checks are not routinely done. So this is what is called routine care, but it's not so. Um, so at least I think that's something that we should do. For the patient who wants to do more, it does involve some issues in, in this. And you need to have, if you are getting them to download and then send you their ECGs, this is a, can be a medico-legal problem, but also a logistic problem for a single practitioner. And that's why I think we need to have a support for digital health. And I think this is somewhere where um, get is probably more experienced in it and would be able to help you, but you need to have a setup for this. Yeah, absolutely. Faisal, can, uh, would you add to this? 
Yeah, no, I would I, I would agree with it with, with the comments made. And I, I actually think it's a very good question because I've, I've been on annual leave. I've just come back. I'm scared to look at my emails. I've been away for a week. I don't know how many thousands of emails I'll have to clear. But the point is well made that patients, once they have devices, they are likely to contact us. And one thing we've found very helpful, certainly in Coventry, is we have very good arrhythmia nurses uh, who are trained, who uh, are cheaper usually than doctors, um, but they're very good at looking at traces. And they can often be an interface between patients and clinicians who often are very busy either in the lab or in clinics, et cetera. And I think having that support structure, and again, I'd echo the comments that have been made by Ben, having that support structure is absolutely critical. We have patients on remote monitoring at the moment as well, where arrhythmias are detected and our cardiac physiologists are also excellent. They log in, they're able to review these tracings. They have a certain level of confidence in terms of looking at these rhythm strips and where there's doubt, they can act as a filter and bring to us tracings where there is doubt or they're not sure what's going on. So I think we need to put structures in place because it's gonna come. We are gonna get more and more patients contacting us. There's, there's no doubt. I mean, the structure is really crucial. And the problem is that it will not be just us who are initiating it or the patients who come to see us. What will happen is that the consumers, because these devices are marketed directly to the consumer, will come and say, you know, this is Dr. Google. The um, patient is ready to see you now. Um, you will be confronted as doctors with people who have bought an Apple Watch or a smart watch or a Fitbit or a Google or an Omron or a complete device, and they will say, my, my complete device diagnosed atrial fibrillation. And they will do this without any prompting from you. We don't yet have the confidence or even the training to be able to respond to consumer-led screening. And I think this is something we need to get used to because it's here. It's not in the future, it's now. That's a good concluding remark from, from Ben F Friedman. It's 11 o'clock sharp, and we have to close this session, this interesting session, on time. Thank you very much, Faisal, that you took the time during your annual leave to connect with us. It's a privilege to have you. Thanks for a great uh, presentation. Special thanks go to Ben Friedman, uh, who joined us this morning and enriched the, the discussion with his... Uh, enormous expertise. We thank all of you for your interest in this session. We wish you another enjoyable day here at the ESC 2022 in Barcelona, and then safe travels home soon. Bye-bye.